Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. The subject of today's show is rural America, its past, and its present. We have with us two outstanding guests, spokesmen on this subject. I'd like for you to meet Mr. Vince Rossiter. Vince is president of the Bank of Hardington in Hardington, Nebraska, in the northeast corner of that state, a town of some 1,600 population. Mr. Rossiter is author of numerous articles on the subject of the economy of rural America. He has been published nationally many, many times by the Independent Bankers Association, to which organization he belongs, in its publication, The Independent Banker. I would also like for you to meet Dr. E.W. Mueller. Dr. Mueller grew up on a farm in northern Iowa. Upon graduation from seminary, he served a small rural church for about 12 years. And right after World War II, Dr. Mueller was appointed secretary of his church's town and country work. And he served in that capacity for 24 years. Currently, Dr. Mueller is in South Dakota as director for community organization and area development at Sioux Falls. Dr. Mueller is truly one of the nation's most outstanding rural church leaders. On the one hand, we have a gentleman who works with the spiritual and social values in rural America. On the other hand, a gentleman who works at the hard financial facts, the material side of rural America. Yes, we have a preacher and a banker giving their points of view. Gentlemen, welcome to both of you. Thank you. It's our pleasure to have you with us today. May I say that this program is the first in a series of two. A week from now on U.S. Farm Report, uh, Mr. Rossiter and Dr. Mueller will be here with me to discuss rural America and its future. But today, gentlemen, the past and the present. Now then, first of all, uh, Mr. Rossiter, to further qualify you, you were very influential, as I understand it, in establishing a committee on agriculture in uh, your banking uh, group, the Independent Bankers Association. When did this come about and uh, for what reason? Well, in 1962, this occurred uh, not so much through my influence as, uh, as my recommendation. The influence was on the part of the leaders of the Independent Bankers Association mm -hmm. who felt that this was a sound uh, uh, topic of discussion and concern for the rural banks, uh, and particularly the membership of the Independent Bankers Association, which is a group of 6,500 primarily country banks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was something that turned out to be uh, very useful in uh, relating ourselves to our customers and their problems and to understand uh, the agricultural economy better as it relates to the rural economy as a whole, as well as our banks. Mr. Rossiter, I understand, too, that you accepted an appointment from Governor Morrison of Nebraska. How did you serve the governor? This was a, a committee appointed by the Nebraska State Legislature to study uses other than the normal use for farm products, such as industrial uses. Uh, we developed processes uh, made from corn starch, for example, to size paper. Uh, we developed a film to package vegetables made out of high amylose uh, content of the corn uh, kernel mm -hmm. and things of this nature. The idea was to find some way to eliminate the surplus farm commodities other than through, through the normal consumption channels. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps one of your greatest accomplishments in terms of recognition nationally, Mr. Rossiter, occurred back in about 60 or 61 in conjunction with the uh, farm crisis report carried on in the Midwest by U.S. News and the World Report. Would you tell us a little about that? Well, this was quite a surprise to me, Iraq, actually, because uh, the U.S. News making one of their usual forays through the Middle West to get information on how the farm economy was operating stopped in. The reporter stopped in to see us and visited with us like they do everybody. I discovered this gentleman had a wealth of information, actually, and so I asked mm -hmm. him to go to lunch with me so I could uh, pick his brains a little bit. And we had a wonderful conversation, and they left, and uh, there was a brief quote in the next issue or so of the U.S. News uh, uh, that I had made. 
And subsequently, I was in Washington, D.C. on a, one of the trips that we made in an industrial uses uh, cause, and uh, I called him and invited him to have lunch with our industrial uses committee. And he came over with his editor, and we had lunch, and after lunch, he suggested I go down to the U.S. News office and, and answer a few questions for the editor and so on. And so I agreed, and it turned out uh, that I was the subject of a full... Uh, scale interview, which was subsequently published mm -hmm. in the U.S. News and World Report. Well, gentlemen, let's get to the subject at hand. Rural America, its past and its present. I'd like for you, Mr. Rossiter, and uh, Doctor, you certainly can comment as we go along. I would like for you to comment on the status quo of rural America economically, and at the same time, answer this question. Did the situation in agriculture as we know it today grow like topsy, or to quote your article in The Independent Banker, is it a result of deliberate debauchery of agriculture? Well, actually, the status of agriculture today is uh, no better and somewhat worse than it was uh, last year, and uh, has grown steadily worse in relation to the other areas of the economy ever since 1951. Now, one could assume that this was due to the natural laws, but the facts uh, seem to refute this, and the truth of the matter is that it is a deliberate policy of government to maintain relatively uh, cheap uh, farm raw material prices in order to sustain relatively cheap food, shoes, clothing, beverage, and tobacco mm -hmm. prices at the retail level. This has been used uh, over the years uh, to uh, reduce the average of the wholesale prices index to make it appear as though the dollar wasn't losing as much value as it was actually. But the, the farm economy has been the tail of the economic kite of the United States and has been used to offset the rises in the other areas of the economy. And it really hasn't been uh, progress at all uh, in any sector of the economy. To give you an example of what I mean in uh, 1954 and 55, the Joint Congressional Economic Committee was conducting hearings to determine uh, what was responsible for the lower farm prices at this time. And among those called to testify was William McChesney Martin, Jr., Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. And Congressman Wright Patman, the Chairman of the Joint Congressional Economic Committee, asked Mr. Martin whether it would be ruinous if farm prices were up as much as other prices. Chairman Martin replied, it's certainly something we don't want to contemplate. We presume that Mr. Martin's reluctance to contemplate the thought of uh, farm prices rising in ratio to industrial goods was undoubtedly because this would result in an increase in the average wholesale prices index and a decline in the value of the dollar. Before this same congressional committee, the same question was put to Oris Wells, the top USDA economist of that day. The question was the stable prices between 1951 and 56, in other words, were at the cost of the farmer. Mr. Wells replied, certainly, if we had not had falling farm prices, the price level would not have been stable. This was rather surprising to many people of the day to think that the uh, top uh, administrative people in the United States would admit that there was some kind of a program to stabilize farm prices at a low level. Later on, uh, before the House Bank and Currency Committee, Chairman Martin of the Federal Reserve Bank made this statement, and I quote, the great shame to me was that we kept stability in the dollar from 1953 to the early part of 1956 by a decline in farm prices, which was being offset by a rise in manufactured goods. He went on to say, in other words, the stability was not balanced. It was farm products going down and manufactured products going up, and the net result being stability. Now, I submit that this is deliberate debauchery of agriculture. Well, Vince, I am impressed by your analysis of the agricultural situation, but maybe your statement of being a deliberate uh, debauchery may be a little strong. I know you can defend it, but I think it was also a matter of our whole agricultural policy that's involved. A significant date in our uh, agricultural history, or particular rural life history, is 1908, when President Roosevelt, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, appointed the first rural life commission. And ever since that commission, we've had programs to make agriculture more productive. Was this the granddaddy of all of our government agriculture yes. programs, Doctor? And out of this came many good things. Out of uh -huh. this came many good programs. But the emphasis has repeatedly continued to be on production, on production. And uh, 
Now I imagine this has resulted probably in some kind of a manipulative program to, uh, to keep the farm programs down. But I think we need to keep in mind that this was a policy and a policy that we as American citizens called for. I think it's time to, to take an honest look at this and begin to see whether the answer does not lie just in production, but perhaps in other areas of better marketing in this light. I agree with you, Doctor. I think that's absolutely right. But it was during the 20s when uh, many great men of that day proposed farm programs that were later adopted in the 1930s, which did work and did enhance farm prices and did maintain 100% of parity from 1946 to 1952. But these same programs, and presumably programs that have been uh, improved upon, have resulted in an average decline in farm prices from that day to this day, and an absolutely static net farm income at a time when the rest of the economy was achieving all-time new highs of income and profit. So I don't say the programs are bad. I say the administration at different times, for different reasons, by different administrations, uh, political administrations, uh, have served different purposes. And in recent years, and I can say this and I think prove it, that since 1951, the policies of government have been for a declining price level in agricultural pro products so that the prices go down a little each year. Now, you can't have prosperity in an economy with a declining price level when all other sectors of the economy have a rising price level, and this is a problem today. But you see, the thought was to make that up by being more proficient in production. This, I think, is a fallacy. So I agree with your facts. Yes. Thank okay, you. well, now we've talked about the economic deficiencies, and certainly they're evident and have been evident in the past. Let's get into uh, your area, uh, Dr. Mueller. Sociologically and spiritually, in your opinion, what have been the deficiencies of rural America? Well, I think our deficiencies sociologically are very closely tied in with this agricultural analysis that Vince has given us. We have made agriculture more productive, and we have substituted capital for people. For example, when a man buys a seven-bottom plow, he's substituting capital for people. Mm -hmm. This makes agriculture more efficient economically, but it means less people on the land. It means less schools and less churches. You see. So this has resulted in an out-migration of people. And uh, I'm not saying this is bad, but this is a fact that through our uh, advanced and effective technological innovation, we have in a very large degree substituted capital for people, and this has made us, made the uh, efficient agricultural machine. Mm -hmm. For example, we worked real hard to get REA to the rural areas, you see, and it was good, and everybody's for this. But immediately when the farmers had electricity in the farm, they began using electrical motors, and electrical motors began to place, replace youth, and so youth was leaving to go to the cities to make electrical motors. Now, this resulted in an, a, a tremendous out-migration of the rural areas. I think in the last 25 years, for example, we've had an out-migration of about uh, 19 million people. That's, that's an immigration like we had from Europe yes. to America. See? It's very serious. I think we uh, were using figures two or three weeks ago. At the present time, about 2,500 farmers per week are leaving the farm. And you see, and, they, and this leaves the people that are left behind with obsolete structures. We're concerned about the people leaving, and rightly so, uh -huh. but the people left behind have the same number of school districts, the same number of political districts, the same number of churches, and often we well, in fact, it can be proved, proven that in some areas where we have the most churches per capita, we also have the most unchurched people. <laughs> That's very That's interesting. interesting. Because of no one, is, because it, the units aren't large enough. Yes. Yeah. And this has left the people with a real problem of making adjustments. And in this, they need a lot of help. I mean, they need educational help to be able to know what kind of structure do we need mm -hmm. to fit the new situation. The out-migration problem has left the people with real problems of adjustment. They need to think in terms of new social structures. And for this, they need a good deal of help. I would say educational help in order to know what the alternatives are and what real new structures they need to adequately meet the needs under the present situation. Mm -hmm. What Dr. Mueller has said is, is vital to the survival of the rural areas and uh, the viable rural cities. But it's quite commonly understood that the out-migration of people hasn't cut the cost of doing business 
because the people have been replaced by technology. And in this case, the technology costs as much as the people did. Mm -hmm. So the idea that as the people migrate out of agriculture, we can curtail the income to agriculture is a mistake. It doesn't make any difference, actually, if we finally get to the place where there's a 100,000 farm operations. This 100,000 will have to earn a proportionate share of the total national income. And at present day standards, it would have to be twice as much gross and at least three times as much net in order to do its double duty in the economy. Number one, provide the income for the farmer operator. And number two, provide the raw material income or the new wealth that's necessary to sustain not only the farm economy, but is the limiting factor on all the new construction in our nation in any given year. Now, this is common to, contrary to commonly accepted uh, economic concepts that the money is created by bank loans. Now, if this were true, we would never have any problem because as long as we could loan money, we would have prosperity. But the truth remains that uh, our economy is, is slowly drying up. Uh, uh, the liquidity of our banks is uh, being eroded away annually at a long-term rate, uh, which is becoming uh, almost dangerous at the present time. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mueller, you commented to Mr. Rossiter and me a little while ago before we went on the air that you feel that rural America is on the defensive. I'd like for you to qualify that statement, if you will. I would say that rural America is on the defensive. I make that statement because uh, rural people tend to want to keep things as they are. They like the status quo. Yes, and because they've been losing a school, they've been losing a church, they've been losing a store, and they're, they're constantly on the giving in. Mm -hmm. And uh, this tends to make them defensive to try to protect what they have. Now, I think this probably is the wrong strategy. I think rural people need to get off the defensive and get on the offensive. But to do this, they need the conceptual tools for this, mm -hmm. and they also need to have an idea of what rural America is going to be like in order that they can begin to regroup their forces and begin to initiate such programs that will move them in the direction of making rural America what we would like it to be. When I refer to the matter of regrouping our forces, I mean to include more than the farm people. I think as far as the agricultural problem is concerned, this the farmers themselves have to solve but they need the support of the other citizens that make up the larger community. And perhaps the term rural is no longer a useful term. We somehow need to get rid of the dichotomy between mm -hmm. rural and urban. And uh, we, people who live in a small town of 500 sometimes think they're urban and not rural. It's really one piece. If you really take the, new, the situation as it is today, you probably find uh, that life polarizes around a major city and that people live in many different types of community. They have their convenience shopping center, their partial shopping center, their complete shopping center, and their wholesale retail center. Now, this is one web of human activity. Now, if the people in this larger community, which is often multi-county, could, could regroup their forces and begin to work together and encourage the farmer to solve his problem, be supportive of what he's trying to do, and then the farmers, in turn, be take an interest in the economy of the town, the a local bank, the local store, then we could move in the direction of beginning to build a new type of rural America that wasn't like the past, but something that's quite different, that has a new image and that, that promises more for the future. Doctor, in our so-called farm group, do you feel there is a deficiency in what we might call human loyalties? I think sometimes it's an overemphasis of the uh, concern for the rights of the individual and not enough concern for the uh, interests of the group. Mm -hmm. And we need to have a balance between self-interest and group interest. And then I think we ought to keep in mind that uh, not all people have the same capability. We say a lot about the fact that all people are created equal. And this, in a sense, is true. But this means that all people have the same worth in the eyes of God. But doesn't mean that all people have the same capability. And the fact is that some people are strong and some people are weak. And I would say too often we have the strong exploiting the weak. And this, to my mind, is contrary to our Christian values. And I think the Christian values teach that the strong ought to help the weak find fulfillment. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean paternalism, but rather to create opportunities that the, those that are weaker also can share in a productive economy and help produce part of this world's needs. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting comment because I've uh, 
I've detected that this uh, philosophy of the strong exploiting the weak is the basic uh, economic philosophy of supply and demand. And this has been my contention all along, that uh, unless we can get away from this basic philosophy that only the, the large and the great and the powerful survive, uh, we're going to destroy agriculture as we know it today. As a matter of fact, uh, if the present crop of older farmer dies off and the young crop doesn't come on, we're going to be in trouble in this nation in just a few years. But I think the point that the doctor makes is, uh, is important. Uh, now, I've felt in our area that had we, 15 years ago, been concerned about the little communities around us who aren't county seat towns, uh, losing their, their resources and their services, that we might have been a stronger community today ourselves. Mm -hmm. So as a consequence, and this spreads out then to the, the farm operator, who is uh, the fundamentally the source of wealth and uh, in the whole community. Yes. And unless the people of the communities and even the large uh, agrarian cities such as Omaha and Sioux City and even Chicago recognize that they are uh, the recipient of the income that's created in the rural areas by multiplying the price of a farm product uh, by the number of units produced, and that the income that comes into this economy and, and eventually winds up in the metropolitan areas and through other areas of the economy first has to be created on the farm by the farmer, and he is the first recipient. It's comparable to a, a wage income in a metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. Only to the rural area, this is our industry, agriculture. And if the farmer doesn't create an adequate income at an adequate price level, then we go down the, the drain. And this is what's happening to rural America. And it hasn't been until the, the progressive policies of the National Farmers Organization have been evidenced uh, that there's been any effort in anybody's part to adopt or adapt uh, the agricultural economy uh, mm -hmm. to a marketing economy rather than an exclusively a production economy. So it is true that we must, the strong uh, entities in the rural areas must help the weak entities in order for the strong to survive and not for the weak. Dr. Mueller, just a moment ago, we were talking about uh, a deficiency of human loyalties in the farming communities. I called it a deficiency, and you said you felt rather it was misplaced loyalty, pointing out that uh, individuals were more interested in themselves individually than in the group, and uh, you took exception to that. And I'm wondering if, uh, if anything has evolved of late to rectify this situation. Well, I think the effort to organize farmers is, is an effort in that uh, direction. For example, the NFO. Now, I would say the NFO, to be real successful, will need to be able to get across to people that they need to balance their self-interest with group interest. But too often, however, when they think in terms of short-term gains, and uh, the short-term gains uh, conflict with the losses that they have as a group, they will desert the group. Mm -hmm. Now, this will be the test, and therefore, when I talk to NFO people and address an NFO audience, I seek to make it plain to them that it is their responsibility, if they believe in their organization, to stick with it and to balance their self-interest with their group interest, because in the long run, the self-interest will also win, because we need both. See, this is the key. We can't get along with self-interest, we can't get along with group interest, but we need both. Ludwig Erhard, if I may quote a significant figure in history, when he became chancellor of Germany, he was talking to the labor groups, and he said, we need interest groups. We need the organization that speak up for different interest groups. But then he added, however, an interest group must remember that it is not the nation, and therefore it's the larger group. So we need to be interested in the individual farm, but the individual farm must be recognized that it is not the agricultural industry. And we're concerned about the well-being of the agricultural industry. We're concerned about the well-being of the total agricultural community. Let's talk just for a moment, uh, Mr. Rossiter, about the position of the banker, like yourself, in the rural community and your status quo. In terms of money and banking, what's the most serious problem the average farmer is facing today? Well, I think perhaps the most uh, serious problem is the price problem. But aside from that, uh, in his effort to increase his efficiency and to uh, accomplish more with the same amount of man manpower, he's been investing substantial amounts of money in new uh, equipment, uh, such as silos and feeding uh, setups and things of this nature. 
Well, these things cost money, as I pointed out before. So in order to pay for them, he has to increase his operations. Well, in a period of rising capital costs, this is extremely painful, and of course, this is what we've been having, experiencing this last year. So today, with the rising capital requirements and rising capital costs, coupled with uh, stable and declining farm prices, with inflation, inflation uh, entering into the picture too, mm -hmm. it's, it's an almost impossible situation which is effectively squeezing the, the people and the financial assets out of agriculture at a very rapid rate. Yes. You commented earlier about the difference two or three years ago in what you considered in your bank a large borrower, a substantial borrower, as compared to the same today. Would you... Uh, tell our viewers about that? I'm thinking of the same individuals, as a matter of fact, that prompted the previous comment. In these cases, uh, uh, a loan of twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars three or four years ago was considered a substantial loan. Today, one individual that I have in mind is borrowing eighty-two thousand dollars and another one down the road not too far away over a hundred thousand dollars. Now, their capital requirements are not all being covered by their bank loans. Mm -hmm. They have borrowed additional money in other areas for the capital improvements they made on their farms that required this additional investment. In banking across the country, Mr. Rossiter, are loans exceeding deposits? Loans are, do not exceed deposits, but they're growing at a faster rate than deposits and have been growing at a faster rate than deposits since 1945. The only interruption to this trend was in 1966 at the, uh, at the end of the money crunch, or at the point of the money crunch at that time. And in the last year, it has exceeded the, uh, the annual rate from 45 to 1967 uh, three times. So there's been a tremendous expansion of credit in, in ratio to deposits, or loans in ratio to deposits. Now this ultimately, obviously, uh, means that the money will run out one day. And, of course, this refutes the orthodox economic concept that the bankers create money in making loans. This isn't working out. This isn't going to function. The money is created in the price level and the profit, and the profit earned uh, uh, on raw materials, and uh, this is the source of wealth. And we have effectively curtailed both the production and the price on the raw materials produced on farms for the last uh, 18 or 20 years, with the consequence that we're not creating the new wealth to continue the operation of the economy on any basis, mm -hmm. let alone on a cash pay-as-you-go day-to-day proposition that we could have with honest farm prices. I want to thank you very much, and you too, Doctor, for being my guests today on U.S. Farm Report, and I'll be looking forward to our continuing this discussion next week. Thank you. My guests today have been on my right, Mr. Vince Rossiter, president of the Bank of Hardington in Hardington, Nebraska, and one of America's outstanding agricultural clergymen, Dr. E.W. Mueller. We have concerned ourselves today with agricultural America, past and present. Next week on our program, we will show you some of the effects of the exodus from the farms as it is seen in the small farming communities. And we will concern ourselves with the future of agricultural America. Until next week, then, so long, everybody. <laughs>